Well, hello everybody and welcome back to the channel. I'm Richard and this is Lap of the World. You are joining us for part four of our major service series on my 1992 Acura NSX. At 289,000 miles, it was due for probably the third or fourth timing belt and water pump change. This video is kind of the crux of the series because by the end of it, we will have in fact removed and replaced the actual timing belt and actual water pump. That may have been a little bit of an optimistic statement. And that's what I get for shooting my intro before starting the actual work. Slight spoilers, we end up waiting on parts again. But speaking of waiting on parts, if you're looking for odds and ends related to your NSX, you should look at nsx-parts.com, that's ATR Racing. They have a huge catalog of often hard to find NSX parts, like say a rear upper timing cover, um, which should be on the way. But they are now also the official sponsor of this series going forward. Links in the description. All the videos up to now have been kind of dealing with ancillary stuff and disassembly to get to this point, but this is the part that we absolutely have to get correct. So it's okay if those are the only two things that we do in this video, because we're gonna take our time and take every precaution and make sure we get things exactly right the first time. So with that said, let's start getting prepared. So before we get started, because we're gonna be filming in this area a lot, I need to address this black stuff here. Uh, it looks like a really gnarly oil leak, but I assure you it is not, and it is also nothing to be concerned about. What it is, is melted epoxy potting from the cam position sensors. Uh, they sit up here kind of behind there. I don't know if, you can, if I can get an angle on it. Sure, I mean right there is a cam position sensor, and that would have originally been potted all the way full with this epoxy that has now run down the inner, uh, inner timing cover face and kind of down to the top of the oil pan, I think even. It's really nothing to be concerned about. It is something that just happens on these cars. It has, you know, from by all accounts, it has no impact on the function of the sensors uh, or longevity thereof, really. I, on my car in particular, I know this has been the case, and these have been basically the same since 230,000 miles. That's when I had the lower cover off myself uh, to inspect the timing belt after the uh, balancer pulley delaminated. Before I release any tension on the belt is I'm gonna take a little silver Sharpie marker here and I'm gonna mark teeth. Uh, <laughs> so I'm gonna mark this tooth here on the belt and then I'm gonna mark the associated divot on the crank, on the pulley right there. And I'm gonna go around and do that essentially anywhere that the belt goes over a pulley with teeth in it, or gear, because that's what a pulley with teeth in it is, right? <laughs> so anywhere, there's a, anywhere the belt touches a gear, and I have tooth to trough match marks that I can make, I'm gonna make some tooth to trough match marks. So that's gonna be, you know, at the very least, I'll do that on the, um, on the front and rear intake cams, and the crank pulley, if I can find a way to do it effectively uh, on the exhaust pulleys, I'm gonna do it there as well. I think I'll be able to find a way to do that. I can mark on the top of the belt and just wrap the mark over the face of it uh, in some kind of contrasting color because I know the faces of the exhaust cams are silver. So if that won't contrast, I'll do maybe a dual color solution. Having now marked the belt on all of the gears, I will point out that this should be a redundant step. You shouldn't have to do this, but it was spiked out in one of the write-ups that I read as kind of a, a cheap insurance policy should things move around uh, unexpectedly during the process. So, <laughs> uh, one other thing they did that I did not is they put the match marks on the, uh, on the backside of the belt and pulley because you can actually, if you use a mirror or look from the other side of the car, you can look directly like straight on with those with no parallax effect. Uh, I just put them where I can easily get to them uh, and either use a mirror or use something else to look straight at them from the front because from the front is the perspective from which I will be looking at them while I'm putting the new belt on. And now with my hopefully redundant marks in place, it is time to relieve the tension and actually remove the belt. It's worth noting if you were just doing the belt and not the water pump, you don't need to remove the spring. 
So one point of order, I did go ahead and pull the uh, timing belt tensioner pulley all the way off. Uh, this is one is of unknown uh, age and uh, has, some, has some odd marks on it. I don't know what that's from. But also, let me get this closer to my microphone and show you something that I'm uh, more interested in. So when I'm rotating that, that's the kind of rattly noise that you're hearing. Uh, I'll probably have to boost that in post, but uh, it's not supposed to sound like that. It shouldn't, when you're moving the bearing back and forth, it shouldn't make really any noise. Uh, and this one's also a little bit loose feeling this way, although that's not the way it's loaded, so I'm not too concerned about that. Here is the uh, new, I'll do the same thing with the new bearing, or the new, or rather, well, new bearings, yes, but the new pulley bike for comparison. So really the only thing you could hear there is probably my gloves moving around. So again, not a bad thing to change. Probably not necessary for everyone on every belt job though. So now having the belt off the car, were we, uh, are we dodging a bullet or were we ahead of the game? Uh, well, there's no really non-destructive test for a timing belt from an inspection standpoint. Uh, the way you kind of can check is you can flip it inside out, which is already a bad idea, and then you fold it to kind of what's, this is really probably beyond its minimum, uh, minimum diameter or minimum design diameter there, so which means that this is now garbage whether I like it or not, and you look for cracks. Uh, this belt looks, honestly, you know, if I didn't have one to put right next to it from a coloration standpoint, I would just assume it was new. Uh, it is in great condition. Now the service interval for this is 90,000 miles or six years, and somewhat ashamedly, I've actually hit the time limit before I hit the mileage limit. Uh, part of that is on account of that I changed it off cycle uh, so this belt is only 200 and, since 230,000 miles because I changed the belt uh, kind of as a proactive just in case, or had the belt changed I should say, as a proactive just in case after the uh, crank pulley delaminated and ate my timing cover, uh, just in case any plastic shards had gotten in there and, uh, and compromised the integrity of the belt that I couldn't see with my cursory inspection. So as I said, the major service interval on these cars are generally six years or 90,000 miles. That may have been updated and extended in a later edition of the shop manual, but that's what I'm looking at here today. If I find that's different, uh, I'll put it in the description or you guys can feel free to correct me in the comments. But in that major service, between these two major components, it lists the timing belt as a replace item and the water pump as an inspect item. That's an interesting kind of situation you end up in there because, you know, I, but I guess, I, I guess that's right. So if I were, th this is not service advice, <laughs> but if my car were a kind of traditional weekend warrior, otherwise garage queen, I could totally see doing the water pump every other timing belt service because really the, the, the wear mechanic on the water pump is going to be the bearing. And the wear on the bearing is definitely going to be a number and speed of revolution issue. So if the car is not being driven as much, the timing belt or the, the water pump rather is not seeing as much wear. Whereas the interval on the timing belt, because rubber, 
um, it will just degrade with use or, you know, whether you're using it or not. In fact, if you're using it less, it can actually be worse. Uh, so having that changed every six years, I think is probably a must or whatever the revised, uh, revised standard is. Now, of course, mine is older than six years and is in great condition, but I also use the car a whole bunch and I live in an environment uh, <laughs> or have the car has spent most of its time in that interval in an environment that is, I, I would guess I would call it uh, conducive to long life of rubber components. So it's not a particularly dry area. It hasn't been exposed to UV so on and so forth. Not It hasn't been subjected to too many huge temperature swings uh, or used when it's been exceedingly cold. So that's my caveat there. For the way I use the car, I'm probably going to continue doing the water pump every belt job because it's not that much more. The worst case scenario there, just for the record, as far as the way I can you know, think through this, is the bearing seizes in the water pump. And I'm pretty sure that will lead to a, a horrendous squealing noise that you would notice immediately. And two, the car would start to heat up, which should precipitate you stopping the car before it would have time to compromise the timing belt by wearing through it from being pulled over the stationary pulley. Um, so with that kind of worst case in mind, you know, I've actually had a water pump seized on me before, not in this car, on my MR2 Turbo. And in the MR2 Turbo, the water pump was driven by the toothed side of the timing belt, and it then proceeded to shear all the teeth off the timing belt when it seized. Uh, it was lesson learned for using uh, third-party chain store components on engine critical pieces. Fortunately for me, the 3S GTE, if you're familiar with the engine or the MR2 Turbo and Toyota motors, the 3S GTE is a non-interference motor. So all I had to do was uh, <laughs> put a new water pump on and replace the timing belt, and it was good to go. That would not be the case in this car. Anyhow, we have the timing belt off. Next step, water pump. So before we remove the water pump, let's talk about what we would do if we were just inspecting it. The first thing, obviously, is look for leaks. Now you could use a mirror and look underneath here and look for evidence of any leaks or seepage, uh, ignoring the three weep holes that there are... Uh, there's one that goes out the front of the timing cover and two on top, uh, and it is normal to see, quote unquote, a minor amount of seepage there. Uh, generally speaking, though, once you've kind of had everything through a couple of cycles, by this point, uh, if you see any wet coolant uh, <laughs> around the water pump, it's probably cause for some concern or at least definitely closer inspection. The next thing that the uh, that calls for in the manual is to inspect the pulley and make sure this thing rotates smoothly. Now, I would recommend while you're checking this, uh, I would do it barehanded and in a quiet garage because you're trying to rotate this and feel both feel for and listen for any noise or roughness in the motion of the bearings. Because again, the failure mode here is more than likely going to be in the bearings or in the gasket. And if all of those are all right, then your water pump is probably good. Mine seems in great condition. I'm going to pull it off and store it uh, because, uh, frankly, the water pumps were in short supply when I went to try and do the job this time around. So I'm either going to just store it or uh, rebuild it, potentially, if that's, a, if that's a thing that can happen, and then uh, procure a new gasket in case uh, it ever becomes impossible to find these. With the water pump out of the car, I found, unfortunately, that I'm going to need to pause short of my goal in this installment. That's what I get for filming my intro before starting the work, but it is what it is. Uh, I'm going to need to do a little bit of cleaning, which is kind of ancillary, but mainly I need to procure a couple of dowel pins. Uh, there are a couple of dowels that go into the water pump, and I'll get into more detail on a, as to why this is important in the next video, because frankly, I just don't want the details because they are important to get lost at the end of this video because I know by this point about 60% of the people that started watching are no longer watching. Shame on you, I see the analytics. 
I'm gonna start putting important details in the last like two minutes just so people have to keep watching, but no. Um, so oh yeah, I'll get into why that's important in the next video, but for now I have to go and get the dowels so that, that I can then explain why they're important and then put them in when I install my new water pump. And in the meantime, I also need to do a little cleaning because somebody installed the old water pump using Honda Bond, which is again, consensus in the community with some known experts is that's also a no-no. It should go in dry. <laughs> I will again cover that again in the next episode. You see where this is kind of going at this point. So we're going to wrap it up today. I do want to give a uh, excuse me, give a special shout out to uh, Christian at ATR Racing, who is uh, going to be the official sponsor for the duration of this series. Um, <laughs> I sort of threw this is a, a last minute edit, so I don't have everything in there that I wanted to have in there for his benefit. Um, and his business's benefit, but if you are looking for NSX parts or random stuff that you find missing uh, when you're doing a project, look him up. Uh, it's ATR Racing, aka NSX-Parts.com. And on that note, <laughs> uh, I'm going to call it here. I will see you guys in the next one. I'm Richard. This is Lap of the World, and I will see you all in the next video, if not at the track.